Uh, before we get started today, Susan reminded, or had mentioned that uh, as we were getting ready to do our special singing, she had failed to mention a prayer request for the Neyland family. Some of you may know the Neyland family. They're a gospel singing group, uh, a southern gospel group. They were on their way in an airplane to a Gaither event on an Alaskan cruise, and their plane crashed. And seven, seven of the family were killed. So if you know the Neyland family or have heard of them, be in prayer for uh, that family and all those affected by that plane crash. Where did this happen? Uh, I'm not sure where. Susan just mentioned that they were flying. Uh, the plane was going up to meet the Gaithers for an Alaskan cruise. So, okay. so it, okay. it crashed somewhere. So it Seattle um, or Anchorage. What's that? All the way to Seattle or, or to Anchorage. Yeah, somewhere. It was Seattle or anything. Yeah, they usually fly into Seattle, then oh, Seattle okay. to Anchorage so, yeah. for the cruise. So somewhere, I guess, west coast. But uh, just be in prayer for the, for the Neyland family. Uh, God, of course, we know they're now receiving their reward yeah. as believers but uh, be in prayer for those that are left behind. Well, again, good morning, church. It's a blessed day to be in the house of the Lord today. And I want to start off our time this morning, before we get into Revelation, I, I want to start out with one word, and that word is priorities. That word came, came to me this week as I was praying and meditating on the message for today, but the word priorities. And so I looked it up. I now know what priorities mean. I thought, well, how is it actually defined? But as priorities defined is things regarded as more important than others. In other words, that which is most important to you, that is your priority. Whatever is most important to you in life or whatever, that is what's your priority. My dad, my father, he used to always tell me, he said that, you know what, you won't make time for whatever is important to you. You always say, well, I don't have enough time. When he said, he would always tell me, well, no, you do have enough time. If it's important enough to you, you will make time for it if it's important to you. Or maybe you'll you'll give the most attention to what's most important to you. If you truly value something, if you truly value something or someone, you will make time for them or for that thing. Or you'll give special attention to that thing or that someone if they were truly important to you and they are priority to you. Jesus actually, he spoke many prior, uh, parables about priorities and, 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 and how we're supposed to have the correct priorities. But this morning, I want to actually focus on one in particular. So if you have your Bible, if you would open your Bible and find Matthew chapter 25. Now, Matthew is the first of the four Gospels, so it's actually the first book in the New Testament. So Matthew chapter 25, we'll be starting at verse number 1. Amen when you're there. Matthew chapter 25, verse 1. Amen. Amen. Very familiar parable. This is the parable of the wise and the foolish virgins. Right, starting at verse number 1 of Matthew 25, Jesus says, Then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Now five of them were wise. Five were foolish. Those who were foolish took their lamps, but took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose. They trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you. But go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Look how he answered, though. He answered and said, Surely I say to you, I do not know you. So watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. So when we read that, we have to ask, what do we glean from this parable? Well, first thing we notice is that five of the virgins were faithful. They prepared. They, they were preparing for the bridegroom. They, they made his coming, they made his arrival, they made it a priority. It was a priority in life. Even though they didn't know when it would be exactly that he was going to to arrive, they made it a priority. They made his arrival and the preparation for it a priority. It was very important to them. The other five, though, the foolish ones, the other five, they had their minds and their cares elsewhere. Perhaps since he was delayed, seemingly delayed, the Lord's not really delayed. He knows when he's going to come back. But 
since it seemed like he, he's being delayed, they thought, well, you know what? We have more time. We'll do it later. We'll just put it off and do it later. His, his arrival was not a priority for them. It wasn't the most important thing. For them. And so while the, the faithful, they, they ended up being brought in with the groom. They were brought in, gladly so. But the unfaithful, well, they were rejected. They were actually locked out of his room. And he said, I don't know you. So why start out the lesson of Revelation with this? Why, why start out with all the talk of priority? Why this parable? I think it's because this is not only a, a perfect picture of our culture today. Our culture is not looking for Jesus to come back. And again, we talked about it. You see that in the open mockery and blasphemy in our culture today. So there, it's a perfect picture of our culture, but also I believe it's a picture of many professing Christians today. Many who name the name of Christ, they're not, they're not preparing for His return. They don't see it as something that's important right now in their lives. I mean, we are called the bride of Christ after all. We should be looking for the bridegroom uh, uh, to be coming. But how many of us, I mean, how many of us today, honestly, if you were to search your heart and mind, how many of us honestly today can say that, yes, we are preparing for Christ's return? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I'm not, I'm not going to do that this morning. But in this parable, Jesus, what he's doing is he's letting his disciples know. He's letting all his hearers know that not everyone who names the name of Christ is truly a part of his church. Because these ten were together. They were all looking for the bridegroom. But only five of them made it a priority. The other one had the cares of the world and whatever else was keeping them distracted. So Jesus is saying, listen, not everybody that names the name of Christ, not everyone who says they are a Christian or truly a part of his church or not really one of his brides. There are many who want to live in the world today. I want to live in the world. I want to be the part of the world. I want to act like the world, talk like the world. I want to listen to what the world listens to. And yet at the same time, they want to kind of straddle that fence. I want to put one foot, one foot over here in heaven and I want to put one foot over here in the world and try and live that way. But church, that is an impossibility. Jesus said that you are either for him or you are against him. So you're either for Christ or you're for the world. You, you cannot live in both worlds. Jesus said in Matthew 5, you can't serve two masters. Now, the uh, James, Jesus' half-brother, he speaks more of this. So you, uh, you're in Matthew now, let's fast forward and find James chapter 4. James chapter 4. So you continue on through the Bible. If you know where Hebrews is, the very next book is James in the Bible. So James chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 4 to 10. So James 4, give you just a moment to get there. And then when you're at James 4. Amen. Right, James chapter 4, starting at verse number 4. Read along and see how James speaks of this. This, this duality of trying to live worldly but also, also live godly at the same time. He says, starting at verse 4 of chapter 4, Adulterers! Adulteresses! Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. It's not that, the, that God just dislikes it, but if you try to be a friend of the world, he says you now make yourself an enemy of God. I don't want to be an enemy of God. I don't know about you. But he continues, he says, or do you think that the scripture says in vain the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he, God, gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, because of all this, therefore, submit to God. Surrender your life to Him is what that means. Surrender your life. Quit fighting. Quit trying to live this dual life. Surrender your life to God. Resist the devil. And what happens when you do that? He will flee from you. If you resist the devil, if you submit your life, surrender your life to God, if you resist the devil, the temptations that he throws your way, that he fires at you like a, like a fiery arrow, if you do that, you resist him, the devil will flee from you. And then look at the promise. Draw near to God. And what will he do? He will draw near to you. What a great promise. He says, cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. You double-minded. That double-minded is that worldly mind, that carnal mind, and then trying to also live a godly life. 
He says, lament and mourn and weep. He's speaking about over your sin. How you've offended God through sin. He says, he says, lament of that, mourn over it, weep over it, cry over it. But then he says, let your laughter be turned to mourning, your joy to gloom. What does he mean by that? What he means by that, in other words, is forsake the lusts and the pleasures of your flesh, the things that draw you to this world. He says, forsake that. Forsake your fleshly desires. Repent of your sinful thoughts and words and deeds. Cry out to God for forgiveness is what he says. Throw yourself on the mercy of the judge. Throw yourself at his mercy. He says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And what will he do if you do that? He will lift you up. Church, it's all about getting your priorities in proper order. We've got to have our priorities in proper order. Jesus not only wants to be first above everything else in your life, but he actually demands it. If you're going to follow him, he says, you've got to follow him 100%. In Luke 9, 62, Jesus tells his followers, no one, and hear me now, he says, no one having put his hand to the plow and then looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. If you're going to put your hands to the plow, you've got to keep moving forward. You can't keep trying to go back. Jesus has to be first. He must be first. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Do that first. Make sure your lamps are full of oil. Make sure the wicks are trimmed. For the master is going to return. Amen? I mean, he's going to return. And we don't know uh, the hour that he's going to return. We don't know the day, the hour, the second. But God knows. I'll have to imagine what it would have been like if when they were doing that stuff on Friday in France if Jesus had returned then. Oh. So again, as we come to the conclusion of Revelation 5, and Lord will we'll, we'll finish Revelation 5 today, I want to keep, I want that thought to be first in, in the front of our minds. And asking yourself this, am I prepared for Christ's return? Am I making my preparation a priority in my life? Because again, as I mentioned last week, here in chapter 5 of Revelation, this is the opening volley of the return of Christ. This is what we're seeing. We're seeing the return of Christ from heaven's perspective. It's a sometime in the future. We don't know what it is, but we know that in, in the heavenly realm, it's outside of time and space, and it's in a place called eternity. So we don't know when it's going to take place, but John is witnessing it. He's witnessing this future event. We're seeing it from heaven's perspective. And so again, chapter 5 sets Jesus' return in motion. That's what we're seeing. So again, with all that in mind, let's now return to Revelation chapter 5. Let's finish out the chapter. So Revelation chapter 5, uh, starting at verse 8, picking back up where we left off last week. So Revelation 5, starting at verse 8, John records, he says, Now when he, Jesus, had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders, they fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowl, bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. And then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the, the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. And they were all saying with a loud voice, they all join in this heavenly choir, this heavenly praise. They say, worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, blessed and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. And then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Now notice, if you look back in verse 8, John records that when Jesus takes the scrolls, it says the four living creatures, which are the cherubim, 
and the 24 elders, it says they all fall down before him. And so the cherubim, who at one time, remember they were circling around the throne, crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They were doing this circling. Now it says that they all fall down before Christ. They, they, they are in humble submission to him and, 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 and wonder. And here it says again, the 24 elders also fall down. However, if you remember back in chapter 4, verse 10, John records they had already fallen down. They fell down in chapter 4, verse 10. So how can they fall down again? What it gives us a picture of is that if you can imagine back in chapter, in chapter 4, the elders, they may have fallen down and taken a knee before him. And they took off their crowns and they cast it before him. But here, they fall down now. They're on their hands and their knees. They're getting even lower. Because they're in the presence of something so almighty, something so awe-inspiring, so amazing. They go from taking a knee where they attach their crowns, now they're on their hands and their knees before him. And each of the elders, it says they have a harp, they have golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. So, so what about the harps? Harps traditionally were used, obviously, for music, specifically for praise and worship. Also, uh, the golden bowl, bowls full of incense. They actually, they mirror that which is in the temple, the holy temple. In other words, uh, in, 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 if you were to go to the temple back in the days of Solomon, back in the days when, when Jesus walked the earth, they had golden bowls full of incense, and they were a mirror of what's in heaven. Okay? So everything that was in the temple was a picture of everything that's in heaven. It's, it's, it's a mirror of that. Everything in the temple, and uh, the tabernacle first, and then in the temple, is a mirror of the heavenly throne room of God. That's what it pictured. Uh, you have the golden walls. You think about how heaven just shines. It talks about the light in there. There were golden walls in the temple. There were golden statues of the chairman of God, these angels. Uh, the mercy seat, which was the Ark of the Covenant, the top of it, that was a picture of God's throne because that's where God's presence would come down and, and, and meet with the high priest. And whenever it was in the tabernacle, he would come down and meet with Moses there. The golden candlesticks that were in the temple, they represented the light of God. How about the showbread? That was a uh, picture Jesus as the bread from heaven, the true bread. And here the golden bowl of incense, what is it? It's a symbol of the prayers of God's people. So when they would light it, the smoke would come up. It was a picture of the prayers of the people ascending up into heaven. And scripture says it was to be a, a sweet aroma to God, our prayers. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 5, and when it talks about earthly priests, it describes them as those who serve the copy and the shadow of the heavenly things. Now, we don't have time to go through all of it today. Perhaps one Sunday we'll, we'll do a special uh, sermon on the, the tabernacle and the temple. But I would make a note here in this section on, in, in, in chapter 5. Go back to Exodus. Go back to Leviticus and look at the pattern because God gives Moses a very specific pattern for how to, how to build the tabernacle. Everything that they have to put into place. Well, uh, how, the, how the temple was set up. Because again, it is a replica of God's throne room. So if you see inside the temple and the tabernacle, that's what God's... It's a mirror of what's going on in the heavenly realm. And again, not only does that point to God's throne room, but it also points to Jesus Christ. Everything in the temple points to Jesus. So it's a fascinating study. Make a note of it. Go back and look through Exodus, look through uh, Leviticus in, in your devotional time, in your, in your scripture reading time, and just see for yourself how it points to Jesus. But anyway, let's go on. So these golden bowls of incense, prayers of the saints, it actually, that draws from uh, Psalm 141. Psalm 141, verse 2. David, in this psalm, what he's doing is he is crying out to God for refuge and for deliverance from evil men. He's being persecuted. He's being attacked. And so he writes his psalm, and in it, he's, he's, this is a prayer for refuge. He wants God to protect him, to deliver him from these evil men and from the forces of darkness. And listen to what David writes. He says, let my prayer be set before you as incense, the lifting up of my hands at the evening sacrifice. Now let's connect these images. Let, let's, let's connect all this together. I mentioned harps in Scripture. It, it represented uh, music, praise, and worship. But in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 10, we get another picture of what harps are used for. The prophet Samuel in, in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 10, he reveals that harps also deal with prophecy. He says that the, the, the prophets would come with harps prophesying. And so that's kind of connected together. And so here in Revelation 5, it's showing that prophecy now is being fulfilled along with the prayers 
and petitions of God's people, the saints of God. They, what are the people praying for? What do we pray for? We pray for deliverance. We pray for protection. We pray for divine justice to be done, God's will to be done. And so Jesus, he promised to return. He promised to make all things right. He promised the end of sin, the end of Satan, the, the end of demons, the end of the wicked. He promised the, the return of Christ to establish his eternal kingdom. All these prayers through all the centuries, all the promises of prophecy, all of it is now coming together in this picture. So you have these, these harps they're playing. They have these the, the, the prayers of the saints. It's all, it's all coming together. It's all about to be fulfilled. And the result is what? It's falling down and worshiping the king of kings. Look again at verses 9 and 10. Whenever all this is happening, they sing a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll to open its seals, for you were slain, Jesus. You have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, you've made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on earth. This is a glorious song of redemption. You have been redeemed. All is made right. All is made new because of Christ's obedience. He perfectly fulfilled. Where we break God's law, Jesus perfectly, obediently fulfilled God's law. And then through His sacrifice and His resurrection, because of all that, we are made new. We are the redeemed. That's what Scripture calls us. It calls you today. If you were born again, you are the redeemed of Christ. And not just one group of people. In other words, it's not, not just for the Jews. They thought, remember back in the day, it's just for us. We have this special relationship with Yahweh God. Nobody else can and nobody else does. But now through Christ, it says here that it's now people from every tribe. It's people from every tongue and every nation. In other words, any and all who would confess the name of Jesus Christ in repentance of faith can now come into this relationship with the one true and living God. Salvation is offered to whosoever shall believe and, and call upon the name of the Lord. And that's good news. That's great news. Amen. Now those reading this in John's day, they were probably, they were probably ecstatic whenever they would hear this because they would, they would know more than likely the Old Testament. They would know a lot of the prophecies. And they would, their minds, as, as they're reading this, they would reflect it back to Isaiah's prophecy. Isaiah prophesied this exact event. He saw this exact event. And whenever it comes to being. So hold your place here in Revelation 5 and let's go back to the prophet Isaiah. Back to the prophet Isaiah. So if you know where Psalms is at, find Psalms and then move forward to Proverbs, then to Ecclesiastes, and then the Song of Solomon. Then you come to Isaiah. And we're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 42. So Isaiah 42. Amen. You're there. Just a moment. Amen. Right, looking at first. 13 verses. Now, verses 1 to 9 were actually fulfilled at Christ's first coming, and then verses 10 to 13 is going to be fulfilled at His second coming. So, uh, chapter 42 of Isaiah, starting at verse 1, says, Behold, my, my servant, now this is actually Yahweh speaking through the prophet. He says, Behold, my servant, whom I, uh, whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. He's talking about Jesus. The Father's talking about Jesus. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He will not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. A smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. He will not fail, nor be discouraged, till he has established justice in the earth. And the coastland shall wait for his law. Thus says God, Yahweh, who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread forth the earth and that which comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk on it. I, Yahweh, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. He's speaking of Jesus. To open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. I am Yahweh. That is my name. And my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to carved images. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Sing to Yahweh a new song. 
Here's the prophecy. Here's looking ahead in Revelation 5. Sing to Yahweh a new song and His praise from the ends of the earth. You who go down to the sea and all that is in it. You coastlines and you inhabitants of them. Let the wilderness and its cities lift up their voice. The villages that Kedar inhabits. Let the inhabitants of Selah sing. Let them shout from the top of the mountains. Let them give glory to Yahweh and declare His praise in the coastlands. Yahweh shall go forth like a mighty man. He shall stir up his zeal like a man of war. He shall cry out, yes, shout aloud. He shall prevail against his enemies. Oh, we look forward to that. And that's the new song they sing in heaven. As Jesus stands and he opens the scroll and he begins to break the seals, they're singing this song to him. So let's turn back to, to Revelation 5 now. So again, people are hearing this, they're reading this. You're worried to take the scroll, open it, you've redeemed us. Every tribe, every nation made us kings. They're connecting it back to Isaiah 42, 1 13. This great prophecy that Yahweh had spoken. But back here in, in chapter 5, here they sing that they had been made kings, they had been made priests. To our God. Now this speaks of ruling and reigning. We're going to have an opportunity to rule and reign with Christ. And also, that we'll also be as priests. In other words, we'll be servants. Priests were servants. They were servants to God. They, they come before God. And now we will have permanent access to God. And yes, we have authority given to us by the king of the universe. But at the same time, we are priests who serve our God and king in humble submission. So we have this dual role. Yes, we reign and we rule, but at the same time, we recognize He is the King, and we fall in submission to Him. Now, look at verse 11. John records, he says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, the elders, the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. So how many angels are there now? How many angels? Is 10,000 times 10,000. I got to thinking that math's way above my pay grade. 10,000 times 10,000. I don't have that many fingers and toes. Let me get out the calculator. See how many 10,000 times 10,000 is. Anybody know how much that equals out to, by the way? A bunch. A bunch. That's, that's the technical term. It, is, uh, it equals 100 million. 100 million angels. Can you imagine 100 million angels? So if you really want to do the math, and you're good at it, and I tried to figure it out, gave myself an ice cream headache. So if there's 100 million that are still in heaven, and Satan took a third of them, how many was there originally? I don't know. Maybe you can figure it out. I don't have the math in my head for that. But that's just a side subject there. So there's thousands upon, there's so many that John couldn't count. I mean, it's, it's almost, remember how we talk about how it's like a curtain being open and John sees the throne and then he sees the elder on the throne and then he sees the cherubim and then it just keeps getting wider and wider. Now it's almost like the curtain's just been pulled back all the way and he sees this massive choir all around the throne of God of a hundred million angels crying out and singing in praise and they all join in this, this praise and this worship. Look at verse 12. You can imagine how thunderous this would sound if you've ever been in a, in a, in a stadium in a sporting event. It's just packed as you can get packed. And you hear the voices thunder and you can't imagine a hundred million voices. And it says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Notice they cry out with seven different praises. There's power, there's riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, blessing. He is perfection personified is what they're trying to say. You say this is perfect, that's perfect. No, Jesus is perfect. He is the very definition of perfect. Our God is perfect in all of His ways. Seven is the number of completion. It's the number of perfection. In Christ Jesus, God the Son is the very definition of perfect. In all His ways, He is complete. It's no wonder that Paul said in Romans 8.31 that if God is for us, who can be against us? What do you got to worry about? We got God on our side. Church, God is for you. Did you know that? Did you know that He is for you? He, if you are in Christ today, He is not against you. Even though you may go through trials and sickness and struggles and persecution, it does not mean that God is against you. He is for you. God is for you. And He is with you always. Even in times in the valley where you're like, I don't, I don't see God, I can't hear God, I'm being crushed right now. God, are you there? He is there. He is always there. He is with you always. And He loves you more completely and more perfectly than any human could ever love you. 
is hard to believe even more than a mama's love, even more than a grandmama's love. He loves you more than that. He loves you more completely and more perfectly than any human or anything possibly could ever love you. Look at verse 13. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as that are in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. It just keeps getting more and more praise. The more, the more Christ is unveiled, the more he is revealed. And this parallels Psalm 150. Listen to Psalm 150. The psalmist writes this, Praise Yahweh. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty firmament. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the lute and the harp. Praise Him with the timbrel and dance. Praise Him with string instruments and with flutes. Praise Him with loud cymbals. Praise Him with clashing cymbals. And then here it is. The tie-in to Revelation 5.13. So if you wanted to write beside Revelation 5.13, Psalm 150, the psalmist says, Let everything that has breath praise Yahweh, praise the Lord. Everything that has breath. Praise Yahweh, praise the Lord. We as born-again believers, we recognize who God truly is. We see Him as He truly is. And we praise His holy name. And when you hear the birds singing, some are always like to say that's the birds singing praises to God. So think about that. When you hear the birds singing, they're, they're praising God. They're, they're, they're just singing praises to God. When you go out at night and you hear, hear the, the crickets, last night we were, we were outside for a little bit, and you could just, it was almost deafening how loud they were. It's like, man, they're singing praises to God right now. They're, just, they're praising, they're singing. Let everything that has breath Every creature in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth, and in the sea, everything and everyone praise and honor and worship Jesus. And Paul said in Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 to 11, that the name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Every knee should bow. Of those that are in heaven, of those that are on the earth, of those under the earth, that at the, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Verse 14. When all this happens, then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders, they fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Amen. What does that mean? That means let it be so. Let it be. Let it be so. Amen. Let everything that has happened, everything that has been said, everything that's been done, amen, let it be. Let it be just as it's been spoken and, and sung and, and demonstrated. Let it be, amen. And then the 24 elders, they go, remember they went from taking a knee down to their hands and feet. Now they go all the way down. They're laying out prostrate before the king, laying flat on their faces. They can't get any lower. Though they feel like they probably should because they're in the presence of God. They're in the presence of the king of kings. Now they're just flat on their faces before Him, praying and praising Him. The heavenly scene of praise and worship is, is, is beyond comprehension. I mean, we can kind of get a picture in your mind, kind of get a, a, a picture in our imagination to what John has seen. But you know what? If you're in Christ today, one day you're going to get a chance to witness this firsthand. How amazing will that be? We're going to get to see it. Our loved ones... Our family and our, and our friends, they're already there, have gone on before us. They're right now giving praise before the throne. And one day we will too. Their demon Christ will join with them singing the praises before our God and King. How amazing will that be? The Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, the Lamb who was slain for us, one day we get to see Him face to face. Can you imagine how that's going to be? We've only read about it. We've seen the pictures. People have tried to paint and do all those things, which God says, by the way, not to do. But one day we'll get to see him face to face. And it's amazing. No matter what you have gone through in your life, if you're in Christ today, you will see him face to face. No matter what you may currently be going through in your life, one day you will see him face to face. No matter what valley awaits us, what's ahead in the future, here on this earth, we shall not fear. We don't need to fear. Why? Because our Redeemer lives. Amen? Our Redeemer lives. 
It's what Job said in the middle of all of his pain. He lost his family. His, all of his children were killed in, in this huge tornado windstorm. His, his house, their house destroyed. He lost all of his servants to raiders. His crops and everything destroyed. His herds were, were stolen and killed. He lost everything. And then right in the middle of that, he says, my Redeemer lives and I will see him one day. And church, he is for you. He is not against you. We have to remember that. We have to cling to that. He proved his great love for you. He didn't just say it. He actually proved it. He died for you. He was willing to lay down his life for you. He paid your sin debt in full. He, he ransomed you from the penalty of sin and death. And one day, he is going to rise up from his royal throne. And he is going to walk over to the Father's throne. And the Father is going to extend his hand. He's going to hold out that rolled up scroll. The title deed to all of creation and the universe. And Jesus is going to take that scroll back from him. Everything that, remember we talked about, it is a, not only a title deed, but it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's like a will and testament. And everything that's inside belongs to the one that has is the bearer. Everything inside belongs to Christ. And he will open each seal. And as he does, things will be made right. He will slowly, he will be taken back the world and the universe and all of creation, seal by seal. And we're going to be starting to look at that next week when we get into chapter 6. But one day he will rise, he will take the scroll, and he will make all things right. And we look forward to that day. And church, he is worthy to be praised now and forevermore. And so I want to close with the two questions I asked at the beginning. Is his return your priority? Is he your priority? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day that you have given us today. Lord Jesus, we thank you that right now you are demonstrating such patience sitting on your throne as the world just descends into what seems like utter perversion and darkness as they openly mock and, and blaspheme you, Lord. But yet, in your great patience and love and grace, you are still allowing people to turn to you in faith and repentance and to put their trust in you that you may save them. And so, Lord, we thank you so much for that love and grace and mercy. We thank you for our salvation. That who are we that you should care so much for us and love us so much that you would lay down your royal, heavenly, divine life for us. But you did it. Now help us, Lord, not be distracted by the things of this world. But let your return, because, Lord, I don't see how it couldn't be imminent. But I believe that you are coming back and it's going to be soon. So help us to keep that as a priority in our lives. Whether you come back or whether we die and go to see you. Either way, Lord, help us to keep you a priority in our life. And help us to be true and faithful witnesses to tell people, to warn people. And to give them the hope that you have given to us. Lord, we ask all of this in the mighty name, the authority that you've given us through the Lord Jesus.